Greetings. This is the one you've known as Jesus the Christ. The beliefs you hold about yourself are powerful shapers of your experience, as well as powerful creators and destroyers of possibilities. How you see yourself and what you believe about yourself are very important. And yet many people are not particularly aware of the effect that their self-images and beliefs have on their lives, even though they experience the results of having those self-images and beliefs. As long as you're unaware of the images and beliefs you hold about yourself, you'll be somewhat of a victim of them. I say victim because the images and beliefs people have about themselves are often limiting and detrimental, since those images and beliefs are largely determined by the ego and by conditioning. Self-images and beliefs about yourself are, at the very least, incomplete and therefore a lie. They misrepresent you because they're only partly true, since they leave so much out. Anything you imagine or think about yourself cannot begin to capture the multifaceted, ever-changing mystery that you are. Your images and beliefs about yourself are therefore not worthy of shaping your life, and yet they do. They limit your life, your possibilities. They steer you in a particular direction, which narrows your opportunities and limits what you're likely to experience. Let's take a look at some examples of how beliefs about yourself shape your life. First, let's consider beliefs around being a man or woman. Each gender is loaded with beliefs and expectations that shape and limit possibilities, often beyond one's awareness. Every culture has expectations for each gender, and so does every family. Children are trained from birth to act a certain way, to develop themselves in certain ways, and to see themselves in a certain way, depending on their gender. Meaning is given to gender. I'm a woman, man, means. How you complete this sentence reveals the beliefs you hold around your gender many of which are limiting. How has your gender determined your choices and shaped your life? You would undoubtedly have had a very different life if you had been born as the opposite sex and not had the conditioning that came with your gender. But then you would have had the conditioning of the other gender. When it comes to gender, there's no escaping conditioning and some narrowing of options. And yet, your gender is not a problematic limitation from the standpoint of your soul, since your soul selected your gender because that gender could best serve your lessons and purpose for this lifetime. Gender and the conditioning that comes with it is an example of programming that narrows down options and provides challenges, but does not necessarily inhibit the soul's evolution. Rather, your gender is part of the soul's evolution, and yet you can appreciate how even the imprinting of something as basic as gender can profoundly limit and shape your life. So not all imprinting and the limitations and challenges it imposes are a problem for the soul and its evolution. However, there is one kind of imprinting that can be very limiting and can inhibit the soul's evolution and that is the imprint of psychological wounding. This is not to say that emotional wounding might not be part of the soul's plan, grist for the spiritual mill, because it often is. However, emotional wounding is the kind of imprinting that can severely limit one's happiness for lifetimes. So bringing awareness to the beliefs that underpin any emotional wounding is especially important. Emotional wounding creates the deepest distortions in one's personal illusory reality and therefore the greatest suffering. Emotional wounding takes the form of beliefs about yourself that create enormous pain and limit your possibilities and therefore the potential for a happy and fulfilling life. Emotional wounding keeps you stuck in the lies your mind is producing and marching to the drumbeat of the ego 
which is a drumbeat of fear, negativity, and not enough. Emotional wounding creates a darkly distorted view of yourself and of life, which spreads its poison to others, often through more abuse or destructive acts. In other words, emotional and physical abuse wounds people emotionally, and those emotional wounds lead to either further self-abuse or abuse inflicted on others. Becoming aware of the beliefs behind the emotional wound frees you from this cycle of pain and hurt. When you are young, you have no identity. You don't know what to think about yourself. Ideas about yourself are given to you by past life imprinting, parents, siblings, relatives, teachers, friends, and others close to you when you're growing up. You're told who you are, sometimes directly, but often covertly and subtly. Children also draw their own conclusions about themselves based on their experiences. One's identity is made up of ideas collected along the way from all these sources. The problem is that once these beliefs are formed, they aren't easily reshaped or erased, and once they are established, they tend to become self-fulfilling prophecies which reinforce those beliefs. Consequently, what a child is told early on about himself or herself is crucial and will largely determine how happy and fulfilled he or she will be. If the messages were negative, that person will have to work to overcome that programming through awareness of it and a conscious attempt to reprogram those ideas. Because the illusion is not that easily seen through, this can take years of diligent effort. If the programming you received was detrimental and limiting, then that is the spiritual work you have been assigned. You are here to learn how beliefs create reality, and that starts with how your beliefs create the reality you're experiencing. If you receive difficult programming, it is not a mistake. It is what your soul signed up for to learn to be a more conscious creator. What better way to learn to do that than to first create something unpleasant? Suffering motivates people to create something better or to make the world a better place. So much growth is accomplished in the lifetimes when you receive detrimental programming. In such lifetimes, it's possible to grow by leaps and bounds, which is why a soul chooses difficult circumstances. Such lifetimes are a crash course in creation. If the learning is not accomplished in that lifetime, the learning continues in between lifetimes and into the next. How long it takes is no problem for the soul. Let's take the example of the belief I'm not worthy of happiness. This is a very common belief, although often unconscious. It's a real stopper, because every time you approach feeling happy, your unconscious mind or the ego must sabotage that happiness or be proven wrong. Both conscious and unconscious beliefs beg to be proven correct, because the ego, which is part of your programming, doesn't like to be wrong. Programming is, after all, programming, and it seeks to maintain itself any way it can. One of the main ways the programming maintains itself is by filtering out evidence that contradicts the programming. The belief, I'm not worthy of happiness, ensures that you'll filter out possibilities for happiness. This might mean that you don't seek out activities or relationships that would make you happy, because if you did, you would prove your programming wrong. Instead, you're likely to engage in relationships and activities, such as addictions, that don't make you happy, thereby fulfilling the edict of your programming. This all happens, of course, unconsciously, as no one purposefully seeks to create circumstances that will cause unhappiness. The illusion is very tricky, 
and one reason it is, is that it is generated and maintained unconsciously. For you to see through your personal illusory reality, you have to become aware of the workings of the unconscious mind and of beliefs that were formerly unconscious. You have to become aware of how you yourself and nobody else is creating your experience of reality and to some extent also creating your external reality by believing what you believe. The place to start in becoming more conscious of what the unconscious mind is up to is to become aware of what you believe, to become aware of the thoughts that run through your mind. Becoming aware of the beliefs that you are conscious of is the first step in unearthing unconscious beliefs because the beliefs that you are aware of are connected to the beliefs that you are not conscious of. When you tug on the string of a conscious belief, it pulls up from the unconscious mind beliefs related to it that you were formerly unaware of. The best way to uncover unconscious beliefs is to practice observing your thoughts, as is done in mindfulness and other types of meditation, and then to dig more deeply into the limiting beliefs that you're aware of through the technique of spiritual inquiry which this author has written about elsewhere, as have many others. This investigation is bound to expose some beliefs that you didn't know were there. In this way, a complex of beliefs that uphold each other, including some unconscious ones, is likely to be revealed. Once this complex of beliefs is sufficiently seen as being untrue, those beliefs lose their power to fool you. Once you've seen through an illusion, as in a magic trick, you can no longer be fooled by it. Let's take another common belief that holds people back. I'm not lovable. Other ways this belief might be stated are, other people don't like me, I don't like myself, I'm not good enough to be loved. This belief becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the following way. If you don't perceive yourself as lovable, or if you don't like yourself, you feel bad inside. You're living in a negative internal climate, which feels heavy, separate from others, sad, and possibly angry and resentful. Envy and jealousy are also probably present at times. Such a negative emotional climate makes you feel dark, heavy, negative, and needy, like a black hole. It also affects how you appear to others. You don't smile much, you don't make eye contact, and you keep to yourself. It's like being painted black and makes you almost invisible to others. If you feel this way inside, others are also likely to sense this about you. If others don't pick up on how you feel by how you appear, then how you feel is likely to be revealed by what you say. You may complain, disparage yourself, judge and gossip about others, play the victim, or drain others with your neediness. You may not think you're self-centered or self-absorbed, but such a negative internal climate keeps you focused on yourself, your needs, your desires, and what you lack. A negative internal climate keeps you spinning around in your illusory mental reality the ego's world, trying to fix the way you feel, not realizing that the ways the ego comes up with to fix you won't help. Meanwhile, you aren't very aware of what is actually happening in reality, including possible opportunities or any love and support that may be coming your way. When you're focused on yourself, you aren't able to be present or loving to others or available to help them. If you were, that would be an attractive, not to mention pleasant, state. When you aren't open and loving to others, then you won't be perceived as very likable. And if you want their love or anything else from them, they often sense this and move away. The prophecy that others don't love you becomes fulfilled, because the you that your internal state has created 
is not very lovable. And of course, it's also difficult for you to love yourself when you feel this way, no matter how many affirmations you may repeat. Even when you don't love yourself, you can have compassion for yourself, which is the beginning of loving yourself and getting in touch with your inner light and letting that shine. Compassion for yourself is the bridge that takes you out of the grip of your personal illusory reality into reality, because compassion is a quality of your true nature. This is a catch-22, though, isn't it? How do you find compassion for yourself in your inner darkness? Well, you have to look for it. That's all, really. It is there. Compassion is the key. Once you know that it is the key, then feeling loving toward yourself is just a matter of using the key. But that does take a willingness to see the truth about why you don't love yourself and a willingness to use the key. Here are a few more simple examples of how beliefs about yourself become self-fulfilling prophecies. If, for example, your self-image is that you don't like to exercise or that you don't like to eat right or that you're someone who adores food, your unconscious mind will do its best to uphold that self-image. One of the ways it does this is through stories. Whenever the subject of exercise or eating comes up, you tell others the story of how you don't like to exercise, how you don't like to eat right, or how much you adore food. If you don't continue to live up to that image, that will make you wrong, and the ego doesn't like to be wrong. So if someone says, Want to go on a hike? You check with your self-image, see that hiking doesn't fit your self-image, and reply, No thanks, I don't like to hike. Or if someone says, I feel so much better after changing my diet, you should try it too. You reply, No thanks, I don't like to eat healthy food. Or, I love food too much to do that. Then you continue to live your life in keeping with your self-image. You don't exercise, you don't eat healthy food, or you put food at the center of your universe. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be being true to yourself, true to your self-image. In this way, you become what you believe yourself to be and what you tell others about yourself. By closing off opportunities to experience yourself differently, your beliefs about yourself are proven true and fortified. Thank you for being here. I am with you always.